Good morning. Let's stand together today as we sing freedom. shadows step out of the grave break into the wild and don't be afraid run into wide open spaces graces waiting for you it's like the weight has been lifted graces where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom, there is freedom. Come out of the dark, just as you are, into the fullness of His love. For the Spirit is here, let there be This is Mary Pierce. Uh, she's been visiting our church for, I don't know, quite some time now. And uh, 
we had lunch a few weeks ago, and Mary said that she had believed in Jesus and trusted Jesus as her Lord and Savior, but she'd never been baptized. And so she wanted to be baptized here in the church. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. So Mary, it's upon your profession of faith. Scoot up just a little bit there. There we go. Upon your profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And this is Mike Pierce. And Mike has made a profession of faith uh, in the last year or so. Uh, is that right, Mike? Been several years ago. It's been yeah, several years been ago several now. Years ago. And uh, Mike wants to be baptized today and uh, follow in full fellowship with the Lord Jesus. And so it's my honor and privilege to baptize you, Mike, as my brother in Christ, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's always a good day when you start out in this baptistry, amen? Boy, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving, and hope you stayed healthy, and uh, hope you stayed well throughout Thanksgiving. You know, we've got a lot of folks in our church body that, uh, that are not well, and so we want to pray for them. The flu is running through, and flu-like stuff is all through uh, this area and all through this state, so we want to pray for each and every one of them. We've got several who are traveling as well, coming back. Uh, this weekend, and so we want to pray for them. And so let's just start the service with prayer uh, for those who are sick and ill and those who are traveling as well. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this day. Father, uh, we are so honored to, uh, to be here, Lord, to worship you. And Father, we pray uh, that you would just add blessing and honor to this service today. And Father, we pray that we uh, would honor and glorify your holy name today. Now, Father, we lift up those who are traveling and those who are sick and ill uh, Lord, among us, Father, we pray that you'd be with them. Father, we pray that you would uh, lead and guide those who are traveling back safely. And, Father, we pray also for those who are sick, Father, that you would, uh, Lord, just touch them and heal their body, Father, that they might come back and fellowship with us once again. Father, again, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this season of holiday and Thanksgiving and moving into the Christmas season. Father, we thank you for it. Father, we pray for those who do not have family and friends that are around them in this season. And, Father, this season sometimes for them is just a great reminder of what they don't have. And so, Father, we pray that you'd be the father to the fatherless in this season of life for them as well. Father, again, we thank you for this day. Thank you for a chance to come and to worship your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, just a few announcements this morning. Uh, this coming Thursday at 10 o'clock, they're going to begin uh, the process of decorating the church uh, for, for Christmas, and so if you want to come and help out, again, that's this Thursday at 10 a.m. Uh, today also marks the beginning of three weeks of prayer for international missions. Uh, we'll have a video to show in, in just a few moments, and so we want to begin that process today of praying for our international missionaries. Also, if you go to our church website, which is westsidefbc.com, uh, and you click on Connect and Prayer, and then you could submit a prayer request online as well. And so that is online uh, to, starting today as well. Journey Kids tonight at 6 o'clock. That's for kids elementary age. Uh, you know, continuing to practice for the Christmas cantata tonight, I believe. And, uh, and also having a Bible study. Uh, evening worship, of course, here in the sanctuary at 6 tonight. Uh, celebrate recovery. Every Monday they start with refreshments at 5 o'clock, large group at 5.30. If you've got questions, there's a name and number in your bulletin that you can call or text and, and ask those questions. Uh, on Tuesday morning, there's a men's prayer breakfast down at 7 a.m. Uh, down at Bentley's Restaurant. Men, we'd love to have you. If you come for the first time, we'll buy you breakfast. Uh, Joy of Living Bible Study is still taking their winter break. We'll resume in the new year, so don't forget about that, ladies and men who are a part of that. And then, of course, on Wednesday night, we're back at it with Awana and youth uh, that night as well. Uh, a few things that are upcoming. Uh, you'll hear more about this in the, in the coming weeks, but uh, there is a, um, a testimony night on December the 8th. It is sponsored by First Priority, uh, which is the 
Christian club down on the school campus, uh, a young man by the name of Caleb Freeman. Caleb and his dad, Jeremy Freeman. Jeremy is a uh, pastor in Newcastle, Oklahoma. His son was in a horrible car accident. Uh, when they found him at the scene of the accident, his head was against the grill of the semi-truck. And so you don't survive that, but he did. And he has a fantastic testimony. And I know it's for students, and we're, we're promoting it that way, uh, but we want you to come as well. I'd love to see this sanctuary filled with not just students, but also our church members and their friends and neighbors that need to hear the gospel. I'm telling you, you will hear the gospel that night in a very, uh, very encouraging way. Uh, and probably a way that you've never heard it before. And so come that night at 6 o'clock. We will have refreshments for all the students uh, afterwards, but we want you as adults to come and participate in it, come and support the teenagers in it, pray for them through it, and also invite your lost friends to come to it that night. Uh, the ladies' event, Jingle and Mingle, uh, December the 10th. Tickets are $20, still available there at the Welcome Center. Also on the 11th, we're having our Christmas cantata uh, that night, and so I want you to come and be a part of that. If you are a guest with us today, there's a visitor card there on the side of your bulletin. If you'll just tear that off and leave it where you are seated, let us know that you've been here to visit with us. We would really appreciate that. And also, there's some boxes there you can check. You, there's a place where you can fill out if you want to know more information about our church. And on the back side of that visitor card, there's a place for prayer requests, and this is for everyone. Uh, if you write down a prayer request, I promise you they'll get prayed for uh, this week. Again, it's good to see everybody here. And I think we have a video for international missions. And then Brother Paul will come and take over with worship. We are Jason and Robin Evire, your IMB missionaries to a part of Thailand called Isong, where we serve as a part of a growing church planning team, along with several other missionaries. We are currently in language study and building friendships with the purpose of sharing the good news of Jesus with the people of Isan. Because of your giving, we had the opportunity this December to share the meaning of Christmas. We did that in Christmas celebrations in different villages and communities all around us. During those celebrations, the love of Christ was shared, the gospel was shared, and relationships were strengthened. Please pray with us for the seven new believers who accepted Christ during these Christmas celebrations. Thank you for giving to the cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. It is truly making a difference in people's lives, both here and in eternity. sing a couple songs about heaven today if that's all right let's stand together and let's sing when the roll is called up yonder when the trumpet of the lord shall sound in time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder i'll be there when the road is called up yonder, 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 I'll be there. On that bright and cloudless morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the glory of his resurrection share. When his chosen ones shall gather to their home beyond the skies And the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there let us labor for the master from the dawn till setting sun. Let us talk of all his wondrous love and care. Then when all life is over and our work on earth is done, and the road is called up yonder, I'll be there. When the road is called up yonder, when the road is called up yonder, when the Yeah. 
yonder I'll be there. How I long to breathe the air of heaven Your pain is gone and mercy fills the streets To look upon the one who bled to save me And walk with him for all eternity There will be a day when I will bow before Him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with He who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the desperation the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day bow before him there will be a day when death will be no more standing face to face with he who died and rose again holy holy is the lord and on that day Join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. With one voice, a thousand generations sing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Sing that again. And on that day, we join the resurrection. Beside the heroes of the faith, with one voice, a thousand generations, sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain, forever he shall reign. So let Father, we do thank you, Lord, for what we have to look forward to as believers in Jesus Christ, that one of these days we will stand in your presence, Father, face to face, seeing you in all of your glory, Father, not just in the, the bits and pieces that we get to see on this earth. Father, we praise you, Lord, that one of these days that will be a reality for all who have placed their faith and trust in Christ. Lord, if anyone here today has not, let this be the day of their salvation. Lord, draw us to you in these next few moments. In Jesus' name, amen.
We've, <laughs> we've just come out of Thanksgiving, and hopefully, uh, as we said, hopefully you had a good week this week. Hopefully you weren't fighting off illness too much. Maybe you overate this week. I did a few times. But, uh, but nevertheless, when you get to Thanksgiving, uh, you know, it can be very, very easy to just sort of get wrapped up in the, in the turkey and the mashed potatoes and the ham, whatever it is that you enjoy, and the football. And uh, I watched a lot of sports this week, y'all. The Razorbacks played basketball Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. They played football Friday. I watched a lot of football games on Saturday. I watched more sports this week than I probably ever watched in one week in my life. It's been a great week. <laughs> uh, but really, when you get right down to it, as we all know, that's not what Thanksgiving is, is really about. It's about t- stopping to take time to thank God for everything that he has done. And there's so much that we have to be thankful for. That's what this song is all about, so we thought it would be appropriate for this day. Every morning when I wake to see the sun I can't help but think about the Lord and all the things He's done. He meets my every need. You know He's been so good to me. And I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done. Even though I don't deserve to live, my life has just begun, and I can't help but praise the Lord for all He's done. There are many things that I can praise God for. And if I started now until I died, there'd still be many more. If I could mention only one, I'd have to thank him for his son. And that's enough to praise the Lord for all he's done. Even though I don't deserve to live, my life has just begun. And I can't help but praise the Lord for all he's done. For all he's done. I'm going to lift my hands and praise him for all he's done. I'll try to live my life to please him. Even though I don't deserve to live, my life has just begun. And I can't help but praise the Lord for all he's done. Even though I don't deserve to live, my life has just begun.
Amen. Amen. As they are coming down, we'll dismiss Children's Church for children ages 3 through kindergarten over to my right. Miss Kim has Children's Church today. Here they come. <laughs> Just like two boys. You see them? They got side by side. One looked at the other one and said, you ain't beating me, big boy. And <laughs> took off. Acts chapter 17, if you have your Bibles this morning, Acts the 17th chapter. Well, today begins the Advent season, getting ready for, uh, for Christmas. I hope you're like I am. You have your Christmas trees up. That's right. I said plural. Christmas trees. We have three in our house. Uh, last night, one of the questions in our, uh, our Sunday school lesson this morning was, what do we not mind waiting on, and then what do we mind waiting on? And I told my Sunday school class, I didn't realize it until last night, but I don't like waiting at Hobby Lobby. I didn't realize, but it hit me last night. And I, I looked at Alicia, and I said, I'm going to go outside, and I'm going to get the car because it's raining. I'd hate for you to have to walk in the rain. I said, I am out of here. I, it's a terrible place this time of year. Well, we spent 30 minutes trying to figure out which stick we were going to buy. She asked me, which one do you like? I said, I, I don't care which stick. One had a red berry, one didn't. I don't know. I don't know. And then when we got to the checkout, she said, I don't know if I like the red berries or not. I said, oh, my goodness gracious. Stand with me on the reading of God's Word. Acts chapter 17, she calls me Scrooge or uh, the Grinch. That's what she called me the other night. I said, the Grinch, I like Christmas. I just don't like all this other stuff. And when you put up Christmas trees in your house, it's like you took glitter and it just exploded in your house. And y'all, I hate glitter. You ever notice when you get it on you, you can't get it off of you, you know? Just be ready. After Thursday, there'll be glitter all over this church because it comes in here too. And I, ugh. anyway, Acts chapter 17, I love Christmas. Can you tell? Beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Now when they had traveled through Amphib Amphipolis and Apollina, I have a hard time with those two words, they came to Thessalonica, where, they were, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths he reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead, saying, This Jesus whom I am proclaim, proclaiming to you is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, attacking the house of Jason, where they were seeking to bring them out to the people." And when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some of the brethren uh, before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world have come here also. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for this day. Father, thank you for all the blessings that you have done for us. Father, as we've just heard in song, Father, we thank you for everything that you've given us. But Lord, if we just have to mention one, we thank you for Jesus. Father, we thank you that you sent him that he died on our behalf, and that, praise the Lord, he rose from the dead. And he's alive today. He's in this room today. And, Father, as best I know how, I seek to hide myself behind your cross and let you speak. Help me to be silent and only say the things that you'd have me to say. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Acts chapter 17. If you remember, uh, things have shifted a little bit. And the Apostle Paul is now has a sidekick named Silas. He gathers another sidekick named Timothy. We see him here in Acts chapter 17 mentioned as well. And so he's got a new party that's traveling along with the same old song. He just preaching Jesus everywhere he goes. You know, faces change, names change, times change, and yet 
the message of the cross and the goodness of Jesus does not change. You know, I think about that in our church as I look around this building today. I see faces that I do not know. And by the way, I enjoy seeing faces that I do not know. I hope to get to know uh, some of the faces that I do not know. Uh, here today, Mike and Mary, who were baptized. I know them, but I don't know them as well as I know some of you and plan to get to know them even better in the coming days. I like to see new faces and new people, and sometimes old faces leave, either by going home to heaven or sometimes they move from this area and go somewhere else. And when that happens, we, we mourn the loss of someone that we love and care for, and yet The message of the cross continues on. We do not change. We may grow. uh, We may change a method or two. But we do not change the central focus of Jesus. He is number one in everything that we do. The apostle Paul was that way. He changed. He went from Barnabas to Silas. And then meets a young man named Timothy. And yet his message and the reason that he exists has not changed one iota. He is still continuing the message of the cross. Point number one is this, reasoning in the synagogue. The Bible says that as it was his custom, in verse 2, according to Paul's custom, he went to them. And for three Sabbaths, three weeks, he reasoned with them from the scriptures. And so he's come to town. He's come to town. This capital city of the eastern province of Macedonia is Amphipolis, and it is the place, it's an original uh, colony of the uh, Athenians, but it's under the Romans at this point. As a matter of fact, most of the known world at that day was under the Romans, but it's under their control. It was the capital, again, of that part of Macedonia. It was near Thrace, which and was situated not far from the mouth of the Stramon River. It followed around the city, and it was... Uh, it got its name from that city. And the distance down uh, to some of the other cities there that the Apostle Paul would go to, uh, Philippi to Amphipolis was only 33 miles away. Apoll- Ap- Apollonia uh, was 30 miles away. Thessalonica was 37 miles away. And so that region was fairly close in proximity that the Apostle Paul would begin in this second missionary journey to preach the same old message of Jesus everywhere that he goes. Now listen, Thessalonica, you need to understand, when we think of Thessalonica, you might think of Higdon, but you shouldn't. It was had a population of about 200,000 people. It's a pretty good-sized city, and especially for that day, it was a large, major city that the Apostle Paul is seen in here in Acts chapter 17. Why was it his custom to go to the synagogue? We've talked about this in Paul's life before on Sunday mornings, but Paul so wanted his countrymen, the Jewish people, to be saved. He would have given anything for them to be saved. Many were saved as Paul would go. Don't get the impression that no Jew in that day believed in Jesus. No, there was a great number of Jews that believed in Jesus. There was a great number of Jews that mourned as he was crucified on that cross that day. But as a whole, they rejected him. As a whole, they said no to the Messiah that they had long awaited for. And it's a sad thing, isn't it? And we celebrate Christmas. Christmas Day is on Sunday, by the way, this year. It's a little different that day. And on that day, I had someone ask me just this week, said, y'all going to have church on Christmas Day? (laughs) Seems like we should, you know? It's like canceling church on Easter. You don't cancel church on Easter, you know? Yeah, we're going to have church that day. We're going to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And you remember when he was born in Bethlehem, you remember where he was born? We say a stable is more like a cave, but regardless, he had no hospital bed with which to lay. He was rejected even in Bethlehem from the beginning. There was no room for King Jesus. You're still that way today, isn't it? No room in a lot of people's hearts for King Jesus. And I'll just be honest. There's a lot of Christians who are born again but are not following him, and they are living as though there's no room for him in their heart. They say that they are saved, and yet they are not about the business that the Apostle Paul was about. They're not about the business that the Lord Jesus was about. They're not about the business of spreading the great news that the king has come, that he lived, that he died, and that he rose again. 
and he's coming again as well. I'm telling you, that's our business. The Apostle Paul knew that was his business everywhere he went, and it was his custom to start in the synagogue. Why start in the synagogue? Well, one, for the Jews, but two, you find people who are God-fearing. You see that throughout the book of Acts, that they go to people who are God-fearing. They start there, people who acknowledge There is a God. It's a good place to start, wouldn't you agree? If you're going to come and if you're going to tell the rest of the story, it's a good place to start with people who believe that there is a God in the first place. But we're going to see before we finish this chapter, he did not run away from those who did not believe in a God at all. He ran to his culture, not from his culture. He reasons in the synagogue. When the Bible gives this idea, this terminology of him reasoning in the synagogue, it's not just that he got up and preached, but there would be dialogue back and forth. There would be questions, and there would be those who would go home, and and they would read in the Scriptures and come back to Paul and say, but the Scripture says this, Ah, and Paul would have an answer for them. You know, Paul, before he was saved, most Bible scholars will say he had the equivalent of two PhDs in Old Testament theology and law. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel, which at that day was one of the best-known rabbis of the day. He knew the law, and he knew what we call the Old Testament top to bottom. He knew it. He understood it. He could quote books and chapters from the Old Testament where many of us cannot. He had been trained in this way. You think about Peter. Peter was a fisherman. And at the age of about 12 in Jewish custom, if you were a young man of prominence, you would be taken away from your family and you would be set at the feet of men, rabbis, to learn and to be taught. And so when you see a fisherman who is also a Jew, you understand that he's not the cream of the crop. He's not the one that would be taken and chosen. He's just a common everyday guy. But Paul was not that way. Paul was a man who knew the Old Testament. You know what I like about those two figures in in your New Testament? The Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter. God used both men. God can use anyone. Anyone. God can use you if you have uh, a master's, if you have a Ph.D., if you just have a B.S. degree. God can use you. And all of us who know Jesus have a B.A. degree, born again. Amen. And if you are born again, God can use you. You say, I'm too young. You, you don't, you, I'm just too young to be used. You're never too young to be used by the Lord Jesus Christ. I've seen young people get saved, get baptized, and next thing you know, their parents are getting saved and their parents are getting baptized. Praise the Lord. Amen. You're never too young. You say, well, I'm too old. I, I've already done it. I, I've heard people make statements like, well, you know, that children's ministry stuff, those young people need to come and do that because I did that. Uh, all those years ago and those young people they need to handle that well i'm telling you if you're alive you're not retired from the kingdom work of king jesus and so if there is a hole that you can fill fill it go do it wouldn't it be wonderful if god called a missionary out of this congregation who is retirement age they are retired and thought they would live on the farm for the next 30 years and then die and go home and see king jesus If God would call a couple out of this church, retirement age, to go overseas and spread the gospel, wouldn't that be wonderful? All the old folks go, well, it would be if it wasn't me. (laughs) What if it is you? What if it is you? I'll never forget meeting a man. His name is David Hines. David Hines. He's serving in an unknown location right now. David was from Oklahoma. met him in South America. David told me the story of how he had retired. He had had uh, a very lucrative career. And he had a lot of money in the bank. And he had retired. And him and his wife was just going to enjoy retirement. And he said, I was minding my own business when God called me to South America. <laughs> At some point, the, the work there in South America stopped and ceased. And so he had a chance to go back home. He said, I don't want to go back home. I want to go somewhere and serve. He's one of those IMB missionaries that we support right now. And he was retired, minding his own business, sitting in a church service just like this one day 
when God said, it's you. It's you. He said, I'd heard about missions all my life. I'd heard about going overseas all my life. I had even been on some short-term mission trips and been so blessed and yet never expected that God would call me. But he did. But he did. And he could call you. You say, well, I'm, I'm to the age now. You may be at the perfect age to be you. But Paul did not shriek back from his culture around him, but he went after him. He went after him and understanding that, remember now, the Apostle Paul has already been beaten. He's already been stoned. He knows the persecution awaits from every town, from every center that he goes, and yet he continues to preach the gospel. You know who always comes after him? The Jews. The Jews. And yet, as was his custom, he went to the synagogue. Who's there? The Jews. The Jews. So in other words, the Apostle Paul, he does not, not only does he not run from a fight, but he starts one in every town he goes to. Now listen, I'm not promoting that we as Christians ought to be fighting and fussing and squabbling. I'm not saying that at all, and that's not what the Apostle Paul did. But what we can't do is shrink back as the culture decays. We can't run from it. As a matter of fact, we have to run to it. If you were to drive down the road today and on your way home, maybe after lunch, you're driving home and you look over and you see a house on fire. It's on fire. The smoke is boiling out of the windows. You see that it is on fire. And you see a lady out front of that house and you see that she's weeping and that she's sobbing. No one else there. Would you stop? I would. And if she said, my daughter is up there in the second story of that house that is burning, what would you do? Would you say, well, let's all hold hands and watch her die? I'm going to tell you, I wouldn't. There's nothing in me that could do that. I would say, well, let's try to get to her. Let's find a way to get to her because we need to save your daughter if at all possible. Listen, church, the house around us is on fire, and they are dying, and they are going to hell. And we are in the time and the season when they are very responsive to the gospel. You know what Thanksgiving and Christmas brings up? It brings up all those who have died and gone on. Doesn't it? It does for me. I go and I see, look around my family and I see family members who aren't there. Not because they're sick and at home, which is the way it was this week. Not for that reason, but I see people who have died and went on. Now, praise the Lord, the vast majority of them went on to a place called heaven, and I'm grateful for that. But they have died. They are not there anymore. And it brings up some of that sorrow and some of that grief. It doesn't matter how long it's been. It's still there when you've lost someone that you care about. You know, there's a world out there who feels the same way during the holiday season. And they remember that death does come. And they see people who aren't there anymore, who used to be there, and they miss them, and they are thinking along those ways. Some are thinking in Thanksgiving, uh, everything that they're thankful for, and the blessings that they have. You hear that from lost folks, right? We are so blessed. Well, who blesses you? The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who blesses you. See, he's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are in a season where the world is bent toward religion and fearing God. And so guess what we ought to do? Take advantage of it. Take advantage of it. And we ought to run into the culture in this season and witness and proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ to the lost and also invite them to come to church. Listen, do you know that still over 80% of people, they say, if you invite them, offer a ride to pick them up, we'll come with you to church. Not saved folks, lost folks. Not people who move into this area looking for a church. We're grateful for them. We want them in our church. But I'm telling you, lost people will come into this building if you invite them to come and offer them a spot to sit with them in church. They'll come. And if you buy their lunch, it's almost 100%. (laughs) Man, go out and invite lost people to church. You know a good time to do it? December 8th when we've got that guy coming from Oklahoma. They'll say, come, come here, a young man who, who he should be dead, but he's alive. 
And he's just going to tell us his story. Maybe December the 11th, which is that Christmas cantata. You know, I, th- I think I've shared this before, but I, I'm not a big Christmas cantata guy. I know that shocks the ones who really know me, right? I'm, I'm just, I'm not. And when we moved up here, you know, we've had them in every church I've been in. and I've had to be Joseph for a long time, you know. Now they ask me to play some old guy, you know. But for a long time it was Joseph. Alicia was Mary, you know, for a long time in a lot of churches that we went to. And I didn't mind doing that as long as we just had to sit there and look good. But when you got to start doing all that talking and memorization of those lines, I just, that's not for me. And, and so I, I told Paul when we moved up here, I said, don't ever ask me to be a part of a play. And so far, so good. And every year, he always tells me, he says, you know, I almost asked you to be in the play, but then I didn't. I said, hey, amen, you know. There's a couple of guys in our Sunday school class who said, well, he asked me, and he rooked me into doing it. And so, you know, it's just not my thing. And we moved up here. Uh, every, every other church I've been a part of, when it comes cantata night, you have a crowd, but not a big crowd. Well, that first night we had cantata, there was not a parking spot in the parking lot. And I said, well, hey, I like this. Get a lot of people here and preach the gospel, you know. And so every year, I'm telling you, I look forward to cantata night. You want to talk about an easy way to invite someone to come? First off, we're going to have food that night after it's over with. So there'll be food. That's easy. Then we're just going to hear music. And a little play. So come and be a part of it. We'll have grandmas and grandpas here to hear those little grandchildren get up and sing. And some of those grandmas and grandpas don't know Jesus. I look around this room and I see grandmas and grandpas in this room now who used to not be here on Sunday morning, but you always came to see those grandchildren. And somehow, some way through that, the Lord worked in your heart. I'm telling you, it is a great time of the year to invite folks to come to church. The apostle Paul goes to the synagogue and he reasons. And then while he's there in the synagogue, there becomes a riot. Reasoning is point number one. A riot in the streets is point number two. If you look down in verse five, he says, the Jews become jealous. Why are they jealous? Well, people in the synagogue are listening to Paul. Paul's gathering up a crowd and they don't like that. They don't like that. They're the ones who are supposed to gather the crowd. They're the ones who are supposed to be preaching and teaching. And the Apostle Paul is gathering this crowd, and people are turning to Christ. And so they become jealous. They become jealous, and they took along some wicked men from the marketplace. They didn't go get the good Christian people. They didn't get the good religious people. They went and got the bad guys. They went and got the bad guys to come and to come after Paul. They formed a mob. They set the city in an uproar. They attacked the house of Jason, which is where they're staying, and they were seeking to bring them out to the people. What were they wanting to do? The same thing they did in Lystra. They wanted to stone the apostle Paul for preaching the gospel. They wanted to kill him. They wanted to take him out. And they couldn't find him. They couldn't find him. But here's what they said of them. These men who have upset the world have come here also. If you have a King James Bible in front of you, it may say something like this. These men who have turned the world upside down. Upside down. That's what people say about people at Westside, right? We're turning the world upside down, man. No, that's not what they say about Westside. I don't know what all they do say about Westside. I, I hear things like it's a good church, it's a growing church. It's a big church. I hear that a lot. But I've never heard one person say, you know, I hear about Westside. Y'all are turning the world upside down down there. Man, you're changing everything in our culture. I don't don't hear that. I don't hear that. You know what? We should. We should. Not just the Westside. But the Christian community should have a voice in 2022. And will you just be honest? We don't have much of a voice anymore. You know why? We're not talking. We're not talking. We're shrinking back. We do talk. We talk in our huddles when we gather together and have to talk about how bad it is. It's bad out there, man. The world's crazy. The world's gone nuts. Homosexuals on the television on almost every commercial. The world's gone crazy out there. They're crazy out there. 
Oh, politics. About to have another presidential election. That'll be fun. That'll be fun. We'll talk a lot about that. We'll gripe and we'll complain and we'll talk about the debates when they happen and we'll talk about who we ought to vote for and who ought we not to vote for and how bad things are. You'll hear about how bad things are. The Republicans are going to talk about how bad things are because there's a Democrat in office. And, and, and if we had a Republican in office, the Democrats would talk about how bad things are because we had a Republican in office. And politics, politics, politics. There'll be very few that'll talk about the church's view politically. You know why? Oh, we ran away. We ran away. I hear all the time, they took prayer out of our schools, and I can't believe how bad it is, took prayer. Well, who let them? I wasn't around then. Who let them? The church. The church. We're not like the Apostle Paul. We're not like the book of Acts church that was turning the world upside down. We've shrink back. We've just let it happen around us. And I'm telling you, we can't let that happen in our culture today. Even if there is a riot in the streets, even if they all come against us, there'll be people who will hate us. There'll be people who despise us. You know who will hate us and despise us? The same ones that hate us and despise us already. Why? Flee a decaying culture. Why not run into it? I make statements against homosexuality and abortion and then all other types of sin, like adultery. I make statements against that. I make statements against things like divorce. The Bible says that divorce is a sin. It's wrong. And when I do that, there's always someone who comes around and says, Brother Doug, aren't you? I mean, I know it's truth, but aren't you kind of afraid that people will be offended. No, I know people are offended. I know they are. I mean, I could preach about overeating too. The Sunday after Thanksgiving. Hello. <laughs> sin is sin, and it's offensive. And the goodness of the cross to some who are perishing will be offensive as well. But there's some folks that he's saving. There's some folks that are accepting of the good news of Jesus. And I'm not after those who are antagonistic against the cross. I'm after those who may be antagonistic today, but tomorrow be open. And I'm going to tell you, there's people in this room who when I first met you, you were not open to the goodness of Jesus. And yet today you're here. Praise the Lord. He'll make a difference. He'll make a difference. But there'll be problems. <laughs> there'll be problems. And so they come. They try to find Paul. They can't find Paul. And so they just say they've turned the world upside down. And they've come here also. And Jason has welcomed them. He says they still act contrary to the decrees of Caesar's. Not true. Not true at all. But they do say there's another king. And his name is Jesus. They stirred up the crowd. They stirred up the city authorities who heard these things and when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. The Bible says in verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. There he is again. There he is again. It says in verse 11, Now these were more noble-minded than those in Thessalonica. For they received the word with great eagerness and examining the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. Therefore, many of them, they believed with a number of prominent Greek women and men. And when the Jews of Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul in Berea, they came there as well. They began to agitate and they began to stir up the crowds. It says in verse 15, and immediately the brethren sent Paul out to go as far as the sea, and Silas and Timothy remained there. Now those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and receiving a command uh, for Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, they left. Now listen, the Berean Christians, they're about 40 miles away from Thessalonica. So they got far enough away that it would take a day or two for them to catch up. 
And so as he gets away, he comes to Berea, and the Bereans were not like the Thessalonians. The Bereans were open to truth. They wanted truth. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that when Paul would get up and he would preach and reason in their synagogue, they would go home and they would study the scriptures for themselves. And many of them found that Paul was preaching and teaching truth. You know what they did? They believed. They believed. There are men out there in our culture today, a lot of them are getting older. Men like Josh McDowell, who at one point in their lives was an atheist, did not believe there was a Christ and that he was the Son of God. And then they opened up their heart and they began to search it out and seek it out and to try to figure out, is he truth? Men like C.S. Lewis of yesteryear did the same thing. And if you go at it with an open heart and an open mind, every person who has has come to the conclusion that Jesus is Lord. You know why? Jesus is Lord. And if you go after the Lord, the Bible says he will be found. The Bible says in the book of James, if you reach out to him, he'll reach down to you. And so I don't know who's in this room and who's not in this room. And I don't know who's watching online or who will watch online. But I know this. If you open up your heart to the truth of God's word and the truth of the Messiah, not just say, I don't believe, I don't believe, I don't believe. But if it's real, I would believe. And so, Lord, reveal yourself to me. He will. He will. A.W. Tozer is the one who's credited for saying it. I don't know who said it first. But the truth of God's word is like a cage lion. It doesn't need to be defended. You just open up the door and let it out. It will defend itself. The problem is we just keep it all hemmed up. You go to your house, how many Bibles do you think you have? I don't know how many I have in my house. I have no idea how many I have in my office. I know on my phone, I don't have my phone in my pocket, but I know on my phone I've got every known translation under the sun on my phone. So they tell me I don't read many of them, but I only read one or two. You've got the Word of God everywhere. We just have to turn it loose. How do you turn it loose? You turn it loose in word. You have to speak the word of God. You can't just live it. Now, if you don't live it, you can't speak it because nobody will listen, right? But if you just say, well, I'm living my life in a way that would please the Lord Jesus Christ, others will see it and come ask me, what do I have? I want that. Well, if they're looking at my life, they're probably going to say, I don't want that at all, right? My life's not all put together and perfect and, and, you know, like a Hallmark movie, you know, where everybody falls in love at the end and goes home and the snow falls. I mean, y'all seen that? Just turn over there this time of year. You'll see that. My life's not like that. Matter of fact, there's some things in my life I don't even want. Why would they want that? The only thing that I have good in me and in my life is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I don't expound it, if I don't tell it, if I don't open my mouth to tell people who are lost about Jesus, they'll never know. They'll never know. So the Apostle Paul goes down to Berea. The Bereans were a people that you want to be like. They received the word with gladness. They were open-minded and they were ready of mind and prepared with the word. They searched the scriptures. They tested what the preacher said. They didn't just take his word for it, but they went home and they studied it. They studied the word daily in verse 12. They studied it every single day. They were looking and they were anticipating. And, and the people, if you look there in verse 12, you'll see what the word says. It says, therefore, many of them believe. Why did they believe? Well, in verse 11, it says they had great eagerness. They examined the scriptures daily to see whether these things were so. If you'll examine the word, the word will open itself to you. It will happen. It will do that. If you do that every day, the word of God will wash over you, and the word of God will reveal what God's will is for your life. The Thessalonian Christians were busy sending out the gospel. Satan was busy stirring up the truth, uh, trouble, and he sent some of his own missionaries to Berea. As the church has missionaries, Satan has his own too. And he sends them down to Berea. What do they do? They stir up the crowd. 
They stir up problems. They stir up issues. And so they sent Paul away. They sent Paul away as far as Athens. In verse 16, it says, Now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him. Do you know what I think? I think in the church of 2022, the Lord is provoking our spirits. You know what that word provoke means? It means he's pushing. He's prodding. He's manipulating. He's saying, get up. He's saying, these things aren't right. You can't just sit and soak. But you got to get up and serve. And I think at Westside, God's doing that. God said, hey, hey, coming to church is great. And, and I want you to come to church. But there are other things that need to be done. There's work that needs to happen. Man, get up and do something. The Bible says that Paul was waiting. Who's he waiting for? Well, he's waiting on Silas and Timothy. They sent Paul away first. They kept Silas and Timothy behind because they're not after Silas and Timothy. They're after the apostle Paul. And so Paul goes to Athens, and he's waiting. He's waiting on them to come. And so he's sitting in the hotel room, will kick back, got a nice cherry Coke in his hand. I don't know what he's got in his hand. It's what I'd have in my hand, you know. He's laid back with a hot cup of coffee, and he's just sitting around doing nothing, and the Spirit provokes him. The Spirit says, hey, Paul, you're wasting time. The Bible says within him as he was observing the city full of idols. You ever get provoked when you're watching the news, and God says, hey, something needs to be done. People are killing people in the streets. Something needs to happen. You ever drive through maybe Conway, Little Rock, Memphis, and you see those homeless people out there, and God says, hey, something needs to be done. And then you say, yeah, somebody needs to do something. What if you're the somebody? Paul was looking around the city, and he sees all these idols. He sees all these worthless things around the city. And the Bible says that the Spirit was provoking him, saying, do something, do something. So in verse 17, he was reasoning in the synagogue. There he is again. You know, if, I'd Paul, if I was Paul, I'd leave those Jews alone. They don't want him there. In every town he goes to, but Paul says, I'm not afraid. He goes to the synagogue, and he reasons with the Jews. Listen, and the God-fearing, there it is again, Gentiles in the marketplace every day with those who happen to be present. So Paul didn't just go after one or two, but Paul said, anywhere I am, the gospel will be. And so anywhere I am and the gospel is, I will proclaim the gospel. You know, I said this a couple weeks ago, but the word discipleship keeps coming up. Around our church is a good word, by the way. A disciple is not just a student of the word, but it's a follower of Jesus. For you to be a disciple, you can't just sit and learn. You've got to go do something. That's what Jesus did. And so if we are going to be disciples, I want to put another word there. Not just discipleship, but lifestyle discipleship. Lifestyle discipleship. You say, Brother Doug, what does that mean? That means that as we live life, we live as a disciple. As we go through life, what would a disciple do if a disciple was to go down to the Mexican restaurant and have lunch today? Some of you are going to do that. What would a disciple do? A disciple would witness while that disciple is there. You say, Brother Doug, how do you witness? Ma'am, is there anything we could pray with you about? We're going to pray over our meal. Anything we could pray for you about? How do you witness? Sir, uh, if you were to die today, do, do you know where you would go? How do you witness? Well, you know how to witness. It's not the how. It's the doing. You, you know what to do. You've been in church long. You, you know. You've got to tell them about Jesus. You've got to talk to them about eternity. You've got to talk to them about where they're going to go when they die. You know you've got to do that. It's not the how. It's the doing. Make your life a life of discipleship. Not a time of study. Not a program that the church does. But a lifestyle in which we live. 
How do you live for Jesus? Be kind. Hey, come back tonight. We're going to talk about the fruit of the Spirit, kindness. Aren't you glad we're not talking about patience again? Amen, for those who were here last Sunday night. Be kind. Be gentle. Be self-controlled. When the Razorbacks get beat by Missouri, be self-controlled. Have some control, man. It's okay. Point number four is this. He ran toward the skeptics. You see it there. We may not have time to talk much about it, but the Bible says there was also some Epicurean and some Stoic philosophers. Oh, philosophers. Don't you love them? They have something to say about everything, right? He saw them there. They were conversing with him. Some saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took him and they brought him to the Aragopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is which you are proclaiming. For you are bringing some strange things to our ears, so we want to know what these things mean. Skip down to verse 22. Paul stood in the midst of the Aragopagus and said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, To an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. As Paul would walk through the city. He would see all of these idols, all of these false gods. He would look and see an inscription that said, to an unknown God. If there ever was a great illustration for a sermon, there it was. And Paul said, hey, they're right. They're right. They are worshiping a God that they do not know. Why don't I introduce them to that God? And so he stands and he begins to proclaim the word. And boy, it's a great word. It's a great sermon which he preaches. He says, this God that you worship in ignorance, he says, I proclaim to you. And he starts out with creation. He starts out with creation. If you look there in verses 24 through 27, you'll see that he talks about how God created the heavens and the earth and that God gives breath to all things. Well, who is this God? Well, it's the unknown God. They don't know this God. And Paul is opening up their minds and their hearts to this, quote, unquote, unknown God. The second thing that he challenges these skeptics with is the incarnation. If you look down in verse 28, he says, in, For in him, in Christ, we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or an image formed by the art or thought of man. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God is now declaring to men that all people everywhere should repent. He starts with creation, says we are a created being. Who are we created by? This unknown God. He talks about the incarnation, that the deity of Jesus, that Jesus came and that he lived among us to set us free. But here's where they, he lost them. He talked about the resurrection. He talked about the resurrection. If you look down in verse 31, the Bible says, Because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he appointed, having furnished Proof to all men by raising him from the dead. The Bible says in verse 32 that when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. Others said, we'll hear you again concerning this. So Paul went out their midst, but some joined him. What happens... When you speak God's word and they don't believe, well, some won't. Some won't. 
You know, a preacher knows this as well as anybody. You'd be amazed how many times I stand and preach on Sunday and people are really in tune and really engaged and some are really not. You'd be amazed how many times we have family members, some of your family members, that come with you. And they're here, but they don't want to be. And it's obvious. You can see it on their face. They don't want to be here. Hearing the Word of God is the last thing on their mind. Many of them come, maybe not this time of year, but in the summer, they come to the lake just to enjoy the lake. Really, they don't even like you that much, but they like the lake that you live by. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I have no idea. It's probably true in some cases, but I have no idea. They don't want to come to church on Sunday. They don't have any plan to come to church on Sunday, but you came, so they come with you. There's a young man. Uh, the mother doesn't go here anymore. She moved away. But he used to come every, every Easter, every Easter in the old building. And every Easter in the old building after church, he would walk out. And literally, you couldn't have poured water on his head and made him wetter with sweat than he was. You could tell, man, God was all over that boy and working on him every Easter. And I asked him one time, I said, you go to church anywhere? No, 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 no. And, and didn't want to be there, you know. And, and every Easter, he would walk out, shake my hand. His hand just slipped through mine. It just soaking wet with sweat. I'm telling you, God was working on him, and yet he never believed, as far as I know. He never believed. And I don't always notice things like that, but it was every Easter. And every Easter, I would see him there, and you could tell, man, he didn't want to be there. He didn't have anything to do with what was going on. But you know what? There were some there who did. There's some there who did. So you just let him go to hell. No. You pray for him. You preach to him. You proclaim the good news to him. Yet knowing that there are some who will never believe. But there are some who will. There are some who will openly accept the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that young man hopefully one day will accept Jesus Christ if he hasn't already. There are some who will be very antagonistic against the truth. And yet one day when God shows up and says, hey... Here I am. The young man who went to uh, church camp this last summer, and here's what he said. He said, I said, have you believed in Jesus? He said, yes, sir, I have. By the way, Jeremy and Caleb Freeman, the ones we have coming this coming uh, December the 8th, they were the speakers at church camp for us. And here's what, the, this, here's what this young man said. He said, I came to church camp not believing there was a God. The only reason I came was for the fun stuff, and then he talked to me tonight. I said, hard to tell something that's talking to you that it's not real. He said, you got that right. And there were multiple times throughout the week that young man would just sit there. And after everybody else would be gone, he'd still be sitting there. And I'd go talk to him, and he said, man, he's talking to me again. He's doing it again, Brother Doug. He won't quit talking to me. I said, you know why? He loves you, and he's after you. And there's some of you in this room that you may have come thinking there was not a God. He was not real. And I'm just going to church to pacify someone. And then you get here and he starts talking. I'm going to tell you, if he's talking to your heart, don't tell him no. Whatever it is, don't tell him no. Whatever it is. What do you do when some don't believe? You pray. You keep working. But you keep moving. You keep moving. The vast majority of people that you share Jesus with will not believe. Just cold hard facts. All but when one does. You come skipping into church and say, Brother Doug, fill that baptistry up because I brought someone to Jesus. You know what you'll do? You'll do what a young man's doing in our church right now. You bring a few to Jesus, you'll say, I need to start a Bible study. Well, we need to start something. We need to do something here because God's obviously working. You'll be so excited about Jesus. You'll be so excited about what God's doing. Nobody will have to coax you into working if you just go and tell. Paul did everywhere he went. Everywhere he went. Some didn't believe. Some stoned him. <laughs> Some running out of town. But everywhere we see a few more picking up and following, not Paul, Jesus.
Jesus. As you read through the book of Acts, you'll see this. The church is marching on. You know where it marched to one day? Grisbury. It's here. And if you're in this room and you've never believed in Jesus, if you believe in him today, he would accept you with open arms. But you've got to reach out. Say, Lord, I want you. I trust you. I ask you to be mine. He come into your heart. He come into your heart right now where you are. You say, Doug, I know I'm saved. I've been baptized and all that other stuff, but man, God's provoking my spirit. I don't have any idea what I'm supposed to do, but I, I know God's calling me to do something. Well, I promise you this. He's not a God who's hidden in the closet somewhere. He's an open book. If you open him up and you begin to read him and you begin to get serious about God, what do you want me to do? He'll tell you. He'll show you. He may not show you this very moment, but you can begin that process by coming and kneeling in this altar and saying, God, whatever it is, I'm in. I'm in. I've signed the bottom of the page. Now you fill in the contract. Maybe calling some of you to preach. Maybe calling some of you to missions. I have no idea. There may be a retired couple in this room that God says, hey, I want you to go overseas and serve me. Man, it'd make my day if I was just in on his plan for your life. So you come and let us know. The altars will be open. If you need to come for prayer, let's bow. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, in this moment, we want to focus on you. Lord, I have no idea what you'll do, but this invitation is yours. Lord, if you're calling missionaries, then praise your name. Lord, if you're calling preachers, praise your name. Lord, if you are just calling a Christian to witness, praise your name. Maybe you're dealing with someone about their sin. Lord, I haven't talked a lot about sin, but maybe there's issues in their life and they know it's not right. And so, Lord, you're dealing with them right now. Father, will you continue to deal? Father, you continue to move. And Father, help us to be obedient to whatever it is you've told us to do. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray. Let's all stand. If you need to come, you come as we sing.
guest with us today. We hope you felt at home and hope you'll come back to worship with us very, very soon. We'll be back tonight. Many of us will at 6 o'clock. I want you to come back again. We're talking about kindness tonight, Lord willing, not patience. Amen. Amen. Kindness. We're moving on. I got a text this week. Jerry, I'm not going to tell him who it's from, okay? <laughs> Jerry, said, Jerry said, you got to be more careful what you preach on on Sunday nights. He said, my wife's been telling me all week, patience, Jerry, patience, patience. <laughs> Oh, me. So patience, Jerry, patience. Listen, we hope you come back and worship with us very, very soon. I know the holiday season is a great season, right? We enjoy it. But I also know that there are many around us that are hurting and that are struggling. And so listen, pray for those. Be open to that. Be looking for that. When you see someone who's hurting, you know, reach out to them, put an arm around them. That's what we're called to do as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Roger, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer, please?